I'm Michael Hicks. I'm the development director for the Noyo Center for Marine Science. Uh, we present our science talk series with uh, no fee uh, to our audience as we believe in removing as many barriers as possible so people have access to marine education. Yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, organizing these talks. So we do suggest a donation of $10 that helps us with the resources to schedule, promote, and produce these programs. And now I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for that. And thank you to all of you who've joined us this evening. I will get right to it and introduce our guests. Um, who I believe really bring a little bit of hope to the sad stories of ship strike and the sad stories that come washing up on our shores. Um, Callie and Rachel are working on a technology-based mapping system that kind of follows the whales, the presence of whales in the busier shipping lanes and the presence of ships. And so sharing that, you know, getting that information out to people who are running ships through those areas and um, they are here to tell us more. I thank them both so much for their time. Uh, they just told me that they both went to UC Santa Barbara and stayed kind of close to home there uh, after finishing their master's work there at UC Santa Barbara. Um, so they're our neighbors just to the south a wee bit in that beautiful area. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to share. So thank you, Rachel and Callie, so much for being here with us tonight. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm really excited to share with you guys tonight about the work that my colleagues and collaborators have been working on over the past few years. So for some context, um, my name is Rachel and my colleague Callie is on the call. She'll be uh, helping out a little bit more with the Q&A afterwards. So we're both project scientists working on WhaleSafe at the Benioff Ocean Science Laboratory. We're an applied marine research lab based down at UC Santa Barbara at the Marine Science Institute. And our main focus is creating scalable and replicable solutions to ocean problems using science and technology. So our projects span a range of issues, including plastic pollution and climate change and deep sea mining, uh, as well as whale ship strike, which is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So when our lab was scoping projects to undertake a common problem that kept coming to our attention was this issue of whale ship strikes. So what is a ship strike? It refers to when a whale and ship collide. And it's something we're seeing happen around the world as the ocean becomes more industrialized, we're getting these important whale habitats like feeding grounds and migration routes that are increasingly overlapped by human activity, including major increases in ship traffic, which can unfortunately result in these types of collisions between whales and ships that are oftentimes fatal. So as you've probably witnessed, maybe even at this whale festival, whales are often feeding and socializing and resting and migrating in areas that have a lot of ship traffic which can put them at risk of being struck by passing vessels. So one of the questions we often get is, well, why can't whales just get out of the way? But evolutionarily speaking, ship strikes are a very recent threat to whales. You know, whales are the biggest animal in the ocean. They've been around for millions of years, but they didn't evolve alongside large 1000 foot ships, you know, speeding through their feeding grounds. So they've not evolved defensive behaviors to this threat. And unfortunately, this is a problem that's not going away anytime soon. Marine shipping has increased dramatically in the last 20, 20 years and it's forecasted to just keep going up. So it's it's something we're all very connected to. If you look around your room right now, your furniture, your clothes, your electronics, even some of our food, you know, 90% of the world's goods are traveling on a ship at some point. So it's something we're all very connected to and we've got to figure out a way for ships and whales to coexist in this very busy space. So here in California, ship strike risk is especially high. Our coastline has important foraging grounds for whales that overlap again with these heavily trafficked shipping lanes and routes. So this map and bar chart shows reported whale ship collisions off our coast from 2000 to 2021. And this data is from NOAA Fisheries Marine Mammal Stranding database, database. So you can see from this bar graph that 2018, 2019, and 2021 were some of the worst years on record for reported whale ship collisions. 
And as bad as these numbers might look, these are probably much lower than the actual numbers for a few reasons. One, as some of you may know, most whale carcasses either sink or are carried offshore by ocean currents before they can be recorded or necropsied to determine cause of death. But then the other reason is many whale vessel collisions go unnoticed, even by captain and crew. And even if they do go noticed, they're not necessarily required to report these uh, encounters to NOAA. They're strongly encouraged, um, but not necessarily required. So a lot of times, many of these collisions are going unnoticed and unreported. So given those factors, scientists estimate that the true mortality is probably 10 times higher than suggested by these documented strandings. So in 2019, we had these 13, but in reality, that would be much closer to 130 when we account for all those in incidences that went unrecorded and unnoticed. The other thing you may notice from this data is that many of these reported collisions are kind of happening in these two hot spots. So down here in Southern California, where Kelly and I are based, and then up in the Bay Area, where some of our partners are based. So these are two regions that have some of the busiest ports in the US. And in the case of LA and Long Beach down here in Southern California, it's one of the busiest port complexes in the world. So there's thousands of vessels transiting to and from these ports each year. These are also two important feeding areas for endangered whale species that visit our coast every year. So we have populations of blue, humpback, and fin whales that visit these waters to forage on krill and school of fish every summer and fall. And this issue of whale ship strike is especially concerning for endangered whale species, where even losing a few individuals can accelerate the possibility of extinction for certain populations. So what can we do about it? The most effective way to reduce this risk is to keep whales and ships apart. But as you can imagine, that's not always possible. So the next best thing is to get vessels to slow down, especially in these important whale habitat areas. So research has shown that when these large ships slow down to 10 knots, this can greatly reduce the likelihood of a ship strike occurring and also reduces the fatality of a ship strike when it does occur. So NOAA, the EPA, and U.S. Coast Guard implements a seasonal voluntary vessel speed reduction zone that's asking vessels that are 300 gross tons or larger to slow down to 10 knots between May 1st and December 15th, which is the peak months we have these endangered whales visiting these regions. So on this slide, it's showing you an example of the notices that were sent out in 2022, or just last season. Um, and the gray zone is the area that ships are asked to slow down. And then the dark blue is just showing you the shipping lanes designated by the International Maritime Organization. So this is where our work comes in, <laughs> very long-winded setup, um, but helpful to get a little bit of context into what really drove our project. So a few years ago, there was a year-long working group process led by NOAA that brought together stakeholders, including folks from the shipping industry. And they brought everyone together to try to develop solutions and recommendations around this issue of whale collisions. And one of the recommendations that came out of that process was a request for new technology and more real-time whale data to help improve situational awareness about whale activity out in the water. And it's important to remember that no one wants to intentionally hit and kill a whale, and they especially don't want to come into port with a whale wrapped over their bow. So it's something, you know, everyone wanted more real-time insight to help with voyage planning and these speed reduction decisions. So in in collaboration with lots of technology and research partners, which I'll get into more detail later in this presentation, we ended up creating the Whale Safe System, which is a data-driven tool that provides near real-time information on both whale and ship activity. And again, it's just giving mariners those extra eyes and ears out on the water. So we launched this pilot system down here in Southern California in the Santa Barbara Channel in 2020. And then this past year, in September of 2022, we launched our second system in the San Francisco region. So this system is providing near real-time whale alerts um, by combining data from three different types of technology, which I'll go into more detail. But it's using an acoustic monitoring system, a blue whale habitat model, and whale sightings. And then all three of these are combined into a really easily digestible whale presence rating which gives those ship captains and crews and folks out on the water, again, that more situational awareness, and it's really easy to digest. 
So I'll go into detail for each of these. So that first piece of technology that's being fed into our system is an acoustic monitoring system. And this was developed by scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And it consists of a moored buoy that's using a digital acoustic monitoring instrument with an integrated hydrophone attached at the aluminum base. So it's probably best to just follow along on the diagram on the left. So attached to that base is the DMON instrument, that digital acoustic monitoring system. And it's listening 24 seven to noise and it's processing and recording the audio. And then it's programmed with the software that's automatically detecting and classifying vocalizations of bluefin and humpback whale. And it's using a library of calls that's stored on board to do that. So then that data is sent back to shore every two hours and is verified by an expert and then incorporated into our whale safe system. So again, we have two of these deployed, one down here in Santa Barbara, which you'll see on that bottom map. And that's the deepest mooring at about 600 feet. And it's outside the southbound shipping lane just north of Santa Cruz Island. And then our one in San Francisco is about 280 feet underwater and it's moored outside the Western shipping lane. So again, this system is built to listen to underwater noise 24 seven. It's automatically detecting, classifying vocalizations of baleen whales and then sending this data back to scientists on shore to provide the near real-time acoustic detections. So just to get a little bit more into the weeds, I'm hoping there's some acoustic whale nerds out there. This slide is for you. <laughs> so this software on board um, that's doing the automatic classifications was developed at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and it's called a low frequency detection and classification system. And this software is able to build spectrograms, which you can see on the left here, which is this the audio from the hydrophone being displayed in a visual format. So it's allowing us to easily identify sounds. So the X axis is time and the Y axis is frequency. So low frequency sounds would be near the bottom and then the high frequency sounds would be towards the top. And this is what a bioacoustician would look at to identify calls as well as listen to the audio. So the detection software is able to take these spectrograms and extract or create a pitch track of tonal calls. So that's what you're seeing on the right hand side. And the software on board is then able to create these pitch tracks and classify each call by comparing attributes of that pitch track to known calls from a library that's stored on board. So it's basically taking like an educated guess of what it thinks the classification is and it's sending that information back to shore where again, an analyst is reviewing these pitch tracks and verifying whether they're correct. So I'm gonna play an audio clip and I tested it before and it's pretty soft. So <laughs> apologies if you can't hear it very well, but this is an audio of a blue whale AB call and it's what these spectrogram and pitch tracks are also showing you. So I'll just play it real quick, maybe a few times. So that first call you're hearing, I'll play it one more time. That first call is the A call, which is in this top pitch track. And that's a series of really quick pulses followed one after another. And the software system classifies these as a call type 40. So you can't really see them very well in this pitch track, but you can certainly see the notations of a bunch of 40s. And then that second call, That second call is the B call. It's the second one in the sequence. And that can last over 10 seconds and it's a, a much lower frequency call. So you can sort of see that one a little bit better in this pitch track where it's this long call and the colors um, indicate the loudness. So that's why they're colored throughout that. So this is just a really common call that you'll hear. And it's, it's a good example because it's easy to see in this pitch track. And this would indicate that at least one blue whale is present. So this is a good example of some of the information that's being transmitted via that acoustic system. The audio itself, we don't get until we have to take, until we service the buoy every year and a half or two years. So what's really just being sent back to shore is these pitch tracks, but it's sort of analogous to a sheet of music for musicians. So 
in the same way that, you know, a musician might be able to see that sheet of music and hum the tune and know the song. This is sort of the same for that software that's classifying it as well as for bioacousticians. They can take a look at these pitch tracks and know what the call is based on these. All right, so moving out of the world of acoustics and into our second technology piece. So the second technology we use is a predictive habitat suitability model to determine where blue whales are likely to be based on daily oceanographic conditions. And this model was built by scientists at NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center and University of Washington. And they use a few different types of data. So this model relies on a long-term satellite tracking data set, which was collected by scientists from Oregon State University. And that's what you're seeing um, in this left animation. So this data set includes satellite tags of 104 blue whales and it's transmitting whale locations or what you're seeing in the animation is the transmitted whale locations as they move from Central America up along the US West Coast and then back down. And then the habitat suitability model is also using a 3D ocean model that provides daily oceanographic conditions. So this was an incredible development that allowed the scientists to really understand the ocean habitats that these animals were using and understand the daily ocean conditions. So this is the regional ocean modeling system. It was developed for the California current ecosystem. And then the third piece is the scientists use statistical models. So they used boosted regression trees, which is the BRT, and generalized additive mixed models which is GAM, to understand the quantitative relationship between blue whale presence and these ocean habitats. So from those, they could then get daily predictions of where blue whales are likely to be. So these are predictions of probability of presence based on the daily oceanographic data. So what this looks like, well, we get a spatial prediction for every day of the year of where blue whales are likely to be again, based on those daily changing oceanographic conditions. So this map on the left is showing you the results of the blue whale habitat model cycling through daily results in the summer of 2019. So the areas in red are the more suitable habitat. So that's where you're likely to see blue whales that day. And then the blue colors represent less suitable areas. So you can see it's changing again daily based on what the ocean is actually doing that day. And so what we've done with the whale safe system is we overlay these daily results with the shipping lanes and we get an average habitat suitability value of the whole shipping corridor. And that is what is going into our whale safe system. The last piece of technology may seem the simplest, but it's still one of the most important pieces we use. So we use humans and cell phones. <laughs> We use sightings uh, recorded from Whale Alert and Spotter Pro cell phone apps. So these are sightings that are recorded from citizen scientists and trained naturalists aboard whale watching tourism vessels, as well as scientists aboard research cruises. So down here in Southern California, we have a volunteer naturalist group that goes out with whale watching vessels. And there's also aerial surveys done by the sanctuary here on a monthly basis. And then up in the Bay Area, we have research partners like the Marine Mammal Center and Point Blue Conservation Science that are doing regular surveys in that region as well. So we definitely encourage folks, if you are out on the water, definitely download these apps and help us log some sightings. So again, all three of those data, data streams are coming into our whale safe system. And this is just, giving us a snapshot of whale presence out on the water. So we have these multiple data streams because it's making our, our whale presence snapshot more robust. So as you can imagine, whales might not always be vocalizing, but they could still be present, or it might be a time of year where there's less whale watching or research trips going out. So again, it's just giving us that more holistic picture of what's going on. So users can explore these data streams on our website. But we're also combining this into a daily whale presence rating to make it super easy and digestible, especially for folks out on the water to get a quick view of what whale presence is like. So this is, we always say it's sort of akin to the Smokey the Bear fire danger sign, um, where it's telling you, you know, how likely it is to see whales out there from low, medium, high to very high. And the sightings and acoustic and blue whale model data are all driving this whale presence rating and they're based on species specific thresholds for each data stream. 
The other thing to know is the system is looking for new data every hour and it's getting updated in real time. So if someone went out, you know, this morning and saw some sightings among that on will alert, our system is looking every hour for that new information. The other thing um, that we'd like to just point out is, you know, we're not trying to tell ships, hey, there's a blue whale 10 feet from your course. This is definitely giving more of a snapshot and it's designed to be more of a warning tool, sort of like a flashing school zone light, but for whales. So it's giving you a bigger snapshot of this whole area that whale presence is high, you know, during that time. So you should be slowing down. That is our ask. We want ships to slow down when that whale presence is high or very high. But that's just an important thing I like to point out. So we wanted to make this data really open, free, and accessible. So we, we developed multiple channels to disseminate this information. So this data is available on our website where users can, again, explore each data stream, or they could sign up for a daily email alert, which will give them that whale presence rating and summary of data. We also have an automated Twitter feed, which updates every morning with the whale presence rating that morning. Or people can pull the data in via application programming interface, which is also known as an API. And this was developed for a lot of our shipping partners or folks that want to disseminate this information far and wide. So it's just a technologically straightforward way to pull all the information and then disseminate it out um, how you please. So some of our shipping partners have done this and then they pull it in to their preferred, preferred fleet communication channels and will alert captains before they traverse through that area. So in addition to providing the whale data, WhaleSafe also provides analytics on our website of how well shipping companies and vessels are abiding by those 10 knot speed recommendations put in place by NOAA, the Coast Guard, and the EPA. So we're able to monitor ship speeds using automatic identification system, which is AIS data. Some of you may have heard of it um, called AIS. And all large vessels are required to have an AIS on board, which is constantly broadcasting their position. So AIS was originally designed, I believe, for navigation and collision avoidance. But it's, also, it's something that we can then pick up with satellite and terrestrial receivers and use it to monitor ship speed. So it wasn't necessarily its original use case, but it's proving very useful um, for helping us in our efforts to monitor ship activity. So we utilize cloud computing and analyze all this AIS data, which is really hundreds of millions of data points. So I need to give a shout out to our software engineers who help a lot with this in the back end. And then we're constantly monitoring ship speeds in the Santa Barbara Channel and San Francisco region. So we then give operators and vessels an overall grade based on how frequently they're abiding by these 10 knot speed recommendations. So what you're seeing on this screen, there's a lot going on here because the whale, you see the whale data up here in the top right, but all these colorful lines are vessels that have transited this region in the last five days. I just took this snapshot from our website today, so <laughs> very recent. Um, but I'll also show you guys a little bit, let me see if this works, of what you can do on our website. So again, we have these two regions, San Francisco and Santa Barbara, where these systems are in place. And then if you explore the whale safe tool, this is where you get all the information about operators and how well they're cooperating with these 10 knot speed limits. So we give cooperation rate and grade, which is just based on their overall to total nautical miles that are traveling at those 10 knot speed limits when the recommendations are in place from May through December. Um, so we have found this to be a really useful outreach tool as we are doing some outreach with shipping industry folks to like to show you know this is how you performed and this is how it compares to previous years and this is where we really would like to see you performing you know closer to 100 percent cooperation oops how do i get out of this all right so as part of this on our website we have these downloadable report cards which again is giving operators an overall grade for the current season. And then it's giving them very specific breakdowns of how many total nautical miles were traveled in these various speed bins and also looking at historical data going back the last few years. So again, we really utilize this um, in our own outreach for shipping companies, but it's also a great tool. It's available for everyone 
to use it. It's available to the public and um, we recommend poking around if you <laughs> know anyone in the shipping industry or are curious how some of these companies are, are cooperating with these um, recommendations. The other thing we do some, well, we do at the end of the season as well as the mid season is we provide these reports of overall whale and ship activity to our research partners, as well as um, to the public via a blog post at the end of the season. So since we just closed our 2022 season, I figured I would give you guys a little bit of a summary of what we saw in both regions. So in Southern California on the left, you'll see um, our acoustic detections for the season. Overall, there was 191 days where our whale presence was high or very high. So that was 83% of the time that those um, speed recommendations were in place from May through December 15th. So if you look at the acoustic detections, you can see there was quite a bit of humpback acoustic detections in the second half of the season. And then some blue whales, um, more in the first half of the season, but we had some showing up um, in late October as well. And then the map on the right is showing you the sightings data collected again on those whale alert and spotter pro apps. So we had 807 sightings of blue humpback and fin whales throughout the season and 56 days of suitable habitat for blue whales. So then when we compare that, we can look at the San Francisco season. This is a little bit funky to compare this year just because our system went into place halfway through the season kind of mid-September. So you'll see the time horizon on the acoustic graph is a little different, but it is interesting to look at. So 92 days or 100% since we launched the system, 100% of the days, the whale presence rating was high or very high up in the San Francisco region. And there were sections of humpback whales every day, as well as you can see in that top acoustic graph, there was a lot of blue whale detections as well throughout those, that time period. And then we had 544 sightings of blue humpback and fin whales um, recorded by our partner organizations up there. So it's interesting as time goes on, we'll have a lot of this data for you know, multiple seasons and it'll be really useful to be able to compare and see what the species are doing year after year and, and compare what, what habitat is important and how they're moving around. You know, this data is going to be useful for us as well as other folks who are doing research in this area. So we also then look at vessel activity for every season. Again, um, that's something we're tracking. So in Southern California, we had over 1,200 large vessels transit that region throughout from May 1st to December 15th. They transited 772,000 nautical miles. And overall, there was a 61.6 .6 cooperation rate. So that's looking at total nautical miles traveled in that vessel speed reduction zone at 10 knots or less. And in San Francisco, there were seven, over 700 large vessels, you know, 142,000 nautical miles and a pretty similar cooperation rate, 61.4%. So this is just showing that overall industry cooperation rate year after year for each region. And you can see it is incrementally going up, which is you know, definitely what we wanna see, but we would love to see these numbers much closer to 100% to really see the conservation benefit of this type of mitigation measure. So it's trending in the right direction, but um, unfortunately for Callie and I, this means we have a lot more work to do <laughs> as well as a lot of our partners. So some ways to help. Again, our ask of folks in the shipping industry or mariners is to slow down to 10 knots 100% of the time when that vessel speed reduction zone is in effect. We're doing targeted outreach to large companies to help achieve this goal. Um, and in particular, you know, we're encouraging companies to ingest that daily whale present alert if it's helpful. You know, we provide it for free, it's open source. Um, we're trying to find as much information, include as much information as possible that will help companies slow down. So. We also ask that operators monitor their fleet's cooperation throughout the season um, and help ensure that all their vessels are cooperating. So if you work in this industry or have contacts, we'd also love to hear from you because we're always trying to connect with the right folks. For those of you not specifically in the shipping industry, um, we also encourage you to sign up for our email alerts or check out our blog posts if this is an 
an issue that's of interest to you, you can follow us on our WhaleSafe Twitter pages if you want to see those whale presence ratings. Um, we have our one in Southern California is up and live and our one for San Francisco is coming very soon. And then the other thing is just, again, you can report sightings through the Whale Alert app as a citizen scientist. So this is an app that's free to use. Um, I just used it last week on a trip out to the Channel Islands. <clears throat> and so we definitely encourage folks to do that, especially if you, if you love whales or are out on the water quite a bit. And lastly, I just really wanted to emphasize that this is a collaborative partnership with many folks. And so it's a huge project and undertaking that couldn't have been possible without a lot of these people I mentioned and some that I didn't even get to mention. So I just wanted to throw up this slide that shows a lot of the partnerships that went into making this system. And that is the end of my presentation. So I think I'll stop screen sharing and we could open it up for questions. That was Hello. fantastic and uplifting. What an incredible project. I, I'm in, I'm absolutely in awe of the work that you've done. What a, what a wonderful application of your, of your work and, and uh, what a great idea. Gosh. Um, I see that people are asking lots of questions here in the chat and I will start. Let's see. Does habitat relate to appropriate condition for prey or actual prey? Um, let's see, does habitat relate to appropriate condition for prey or actual prey? Not sure. Have you noticed any patterns of which countries ships are not cooperating? So those, I'm not quite sure, Karen, if you want to read or say what you mean there in that first question, I'm not sure. Sure. Hi, thank you so much for an amazing presentation, Rachel. That was just unbelievable. Um, my, my question, uh, I know one of the things that you measure um, is, is the prey, is, is has to do with appropriate habitat, so that must be must have something to do with water conditions and other things. Is it is it actually measuring, you know, the the um, what's in the water or just the, the 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 temperatures and the upwelling are appropriate for the whales to be there? Can you describe that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And Callie, feel free to jump in um, and add as well. But that blue whale habitat model is using oceanographic conditions like sea surface temperature and um, kinetic energy and, you know, various conditions. I mean, kinetic energy might not be a good example, but certainly um, sea surface temperature and some of these other conditions that are a good proxy for productivity in a sense, you know, that they can indicate upwelling or um, other, other, yeah, how productive something is, but it's not exactly considering prey directly. Um, but it is, it is in a sense in that these are a good proxy. Thank you. I, I just add one thing that um, when they were building out this model, as you saw in that little infographic, so the tags were actually following the whole southward and northward migration of blue whales. And so um, part of that testing of the model is they were able to look at all of the data, both oceanographic and whale wise on that uh, really kind of crazy marine heat wave that we had in 2015. And the model was actually accurately able to predict the, the whale patterns that we were seeing um, based on the oceanographic conditions. So yeah, as Rachel said, it's kind of a proxy for prey, but there's no really good like layer out there to help uh, understand exact like krill distributions. Uh, so specific to California, usually if we're seeing blue whales here, it is for them to feed. So yeah, a little bit of context there. And then my other question was related to if you can identify if there's any particular countries who's who 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 might have ordered their ships maybe not to comply with the request. Oh man, I hate to to tell you guys this, but some of the worst offenders we have are U.S. companies. So, 
Um, yeah, but, we haven't done any country specific analyses, <laughs> but that would be um, interesting. But as Kelly mentioned, some of our worst offenders are actually um, companies that go directly between the West Coast and Hawaii, doing a lot of um, very fast, <laughs> very fast shipping. Interesting. Uh, Robert, Rob Bird is asking, are fatalities from ship strike a result of the whale colliding with the hull of the ship or being struck by the ship's propeller? And can the propellers be shrouded? Like the, yeah, of protecting a cage around the propeller, so to speak. I don't remember what that's called. Yeah, I don't know what it means to be shrouded, but we do see ship strikes happening um, from both. There is something called the bow null effect and Callie, feel free to jump in, but it's um, the way the ship is moving through the water, sometimes the bow is um, blocking the noise from the back of the ship. So if a whale is directly in front or very close to the front, it might not even hear what's going on back there because of that bow null effect. But I think, you know, you do see in necropsies um, both types um, of, of ship strikes. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, our, our blue whale was definitely hit by a propeller and the graphics were, were put together to show how that, that happened, but... I mean, breaking down how these ship strikes happen, I think that they happen in many different ways. The little humpback, you know, they didn't show external, or a lot of the ones that Mo looks at, or the Marine Mammal Center or Cal Academy team, when they look at it, they're not seeing open wounds necessarily, but they're opening them up and finding that there are broken bones underneath and bruising. So it's that's why the necropsy teams are so important to kind of document all of this um and then can shipping lanes be adjusted to areas outside of where the whales are most likely to be feeding or migrating yeah kelly maybe i'll have you take this one because i know you're around for that we tried moving them down here in southern california there was a whole process of course it goes in can, can be quite a <laughs> undertaking yeah. The actual uh, political process of moving shipping lanes is very, very long and complicated, as you can imagine, but it is possible and has been done. Um, so, for example, in the Southern California, um, in the Santa Barbara Channel, uh, the southbound shipping lane actually in 2013 got shifted one nautical mile closer to shore to help try to reduce some of that overlap of the um, feeding whales and the ships. But as you can imagine, there's only so far in these constricted waterways because we have um, the Channel Islands and mainland California. So there's only you know so much that we can shift them. Um, and then just in, in this region as well in Southern California, on the south side of the islands um, is Navy operation territory. So there's also you know, you know things like that to uh, consider. But uh, there is you know other instances across the world. Um, like right now in Sri Lanka, there's a uh, blue whale habitat that is really being overlapped with a lot of ships. So they haven't been moved yet, but some companies are voluntarily removing themselves from that path and, and going around the whales. Um, but it's it's possible. It's just long and drawn out. Good. Good question there. Um, and then Wendy's wondering, um, why is there a limited period like that date, December to May? May to December, sorry. Um, gray whales would be in there, in the area. So not wanting to leave out the gray whale migration. Yeah. I know the government's um, vessel speed reduction zone has been focused on endangered whale species. So it was trying to match more where the bluefin um, and humpback their migration schedule but yes we want some major shout outs to the gray whales uh you know these these type of measures do benefit all cetaceans um and our whale alert system is going year round so I, you probably don't remember this but the screenshot from today our whale presence rating is high in both southern california and san francisco so 
if shipping companies are ingesting this data directly or you know accessing it in the various ways, they are seeing the whale presence rating throughout the year, even though the government is not asking folks to slow down. I will say, um, you know, it seems like hopefully that could change in the future. There is some discussions happening of maybe a, a year round vessel speed uh, season in the future. So if that did end up being the case, you know, it would be benefits for the gray whales as well, even bigger benefits. Oh shoot, Sarah, you're on mute. <laughs> Lots of people saying just thank you so much and good to know that this system exists and it's benefiting all of us, um, your your work. Um, Teresa Mercer, who is a whale watcher up here, watches gray whales and um, Scott and Tree are out there at Point Arena watching all the whales and documenting them passing by there. Um, incredibly impressive system. Are there any plans to include, include the gray whales in the near future? So that I think you sort of answered that question um, with that last answer. Um, and then Joelle's wondering if the API provided to shipping companies, uh, is, is it free to users? So can we all tap into that? And if so, is it available for other recreational boaters as well? For example, a whale watching boat or charter or cruise ships, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So we want our data to be used as widely <laughs> as possible. So all you have to do, I'll drop in the chat is um, email us if you're interested and we get you set up with um, some instructions on how to access it. I mean, should be pretty straightforward. So definitely I'll, let me see if I can find an email, but I'll drop it in the chat. Oops, that's great. I'm sure we're all gonna pop onto there for sure. Cause we've, you've got a bunch of whale lovers in the house and we've got a lot of activity up here, really. I mean, one of the reasons that the Noya Center really got excited about becoming an organization here on the North Coast is just the lack of, of universities nearby or marine science centers. So we're sort of in between Cal Poly Humboldt State and the Marine Mammal Center in the Bay Area. Um, but nonetheless, we're seeing ship strikes and we're seeing a lot of whales and there's a lot of enthusiasts. So we're, you know, citizen scientists, citizen science, community science, all of those things are um, very much part of what our community and organizations do. Um, Let's see, Elon is wondering if it's feasible to spot whales from high resolution satellite imagery like um, Planet takes. Yeah, we've had some recent calls with folks just learning about that technology and it is something that's being developed and starting to be used. I don't know, Callie, if you have more details to add to that. Yeah, I was going to mention a, a pilot project that's happening for the North Atlantic right whale. I believe it's called um, Smart Whale, and they're doing just that, looking at satellite imagery and picking out um, through an AI model, picking out whales from the imagery. So it's definitely um, out there. Did you say for the North Atlantic right whale or did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. On the East Coast. Okay. okay. Gotcha. I think, I think the project is out of Dalhousie University. Okay. Wonderful. Good question, Elon. Um, and Catherine is wondering, what is the range of the acoustic monitoring system for sound gathering purposes? Yeah, so as you can imagine, this was a tricky part of where to put the buoys because sound travels so well in water. So we actually had um, one of our partners did propagation modeling to determine the best spot to put these in terms of picking up sound in all the areas we want, but also not picking up sound from the open ocean. So in Santa Barbara, it was a little bit easier because we had the Channel Islands as a natural block. So we put it, you know, on the outside of the shipping lanes, but then next to the Channel Islands. So that's able to block um, a lot of the noise that direction. And then we can pick up pretty much 25 kilometers across the channel. But in San Francisco, you know, it's a little bit trickier. We ended up um, going with a spot that again was outside that um, Western shipping lane. And it kind of ended up being species dependent and Callie, feel free to jump in. But I think it was like 15 to 25 
kilometers for blue and fin and, and much less for humpback, like maybe less than five. Yeah, it was kilometers. around five or so for humpbacks and then yeah, 15 to 25 for blue and fin. So you'll you'll get a majority of the uh, shipping corridor um, in that um, in that situation as well. And as Rachel mentioned, you know, it's a trade-off of um, the listening area because a ship captain is not going to care if we tell them that we detected a blue whale within 200 nautical miles. So you want to make sure that your listening area for ship strike prevention, at least, um, is you know handling all of those trade-offs correctly. Wonderful. Um, let's see, Leah, does this technology exist in any other countries or just here on the California coast? So our whale safe specific system so far is just on the California coast, but we did see um, there's a similar project that was just deployed last fall down in Chile. Um, and I know that, you know, there is a lot of ship strike work also happening around the globe in slightly different, you know, looking projects, but their system looked fairly similar in that it was an acoustic buoy that was providing near real-time whale information to ships. So that's an exciting one to keep an eye on. Definitely. Um, and then are Navy or Coast Guard ships included in these data? They're not displayed on our website, but um, I believe, do we have the data, you know, behind the scenes? Um, if they have their AIS receiver on, then we would have the data, but uh, more oftentimes than not, Navy ships don't transmit um, AIS signals. Yeah. For some obvious reasons. <laughs> 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 um, there's the link there, um, and we'll be sure to get these links out to you if you missed them. Um, the link for, um, there it is. If you want that, it's VOSI whale safe at ucsb.edu. Um, and Robert wonders, how will you know if your system is working? Ah, the age old golden question <laughs> we often ask ourselves. <laughs> it's super tricky, right? As I mentioned, looking at reported whale ship collisions alone does not tell the complete picture. Um, so we are tracking that as one metric of just trying to understand if this system is helping save whales. So um, over the last, well, I'm trying to, we don't have the most recent data, right, Kelly? So it would just be 2021, we saw a bad year, but then 2022, there weren't any reported chip strikes in Southern California where our pilot system has launched. So that's a good sign, but of course it's one data point and we need a much longer time horizon to really feel super solid about that. Um, but then that other metric we're helping or kind of using as a proxy for success is looking at those cooperation rates, those industry-wide cooperation rates. And again, they're incrementally going up. So like when before the system was put in place, it was, you know, 50% in Southern California. Now it's 62. So we are making progress, but still a way to go to get to that 100%. But yeah, it's a super tricky <laughs> metric because again, it's you know, it's hard to say, hey, we saved 10 whales. Um, and so we kind of just have those those other types of data to look at to see. Right. Yeah, even just knowing how many, yeah, the, that that 13 whales documented compared to potentially 130 that are, you know, just yeah. It's a it's a lot of different angles without a doubt. Um but I think that you're probably at the point now where you can start to see the the you know the the what's working. I mean, it's just this is an exciting time. I would hope to think. Um, do we know what ship size is most detrimental to whales? Callie, I see you nodding your head. Do you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I would. So historically, what has been thought of as like the main risk is large ships. So um, anything 300 gross tons and or 65 feet in length. Uh, that tune is, uh, is turning a little bit for the East Coast. So uh, NOAA has a proposed rule right now to drop those speed. Um, on the East Coast, it's actually mandatory. West Coast is uh, voluntary. 
And so there is a proposal for that mandatory speed to go down to any vessel that is 35 feet or larger. Um, so that would include a lot of like the recreational boats because they've been seeing a lot of um, a lot more instances where small boats have been hitting whales. That being said, um, the North Atlantic right whale is very critically endangered. Um, and so that status is also taken into consideration in those um, rules. And uh, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen in some of the media stuff, a lot of times when a whale collides with uh, a smaller vessel, the humans are probably hurt a little bit worse than some of the whales, depending on you know the type of collision. But yeah, uh, government-wise or like policy-wise, um, up till recently, it's just been considered large, you know, container ships, bulk ships, uh, row rows, things like that. Interesting. Um, again, great appreciation for everything that you're doing with this monitoring and help into the future. Um, a question, how many acoustic buoys are there in the pipeline? So we don't have any in the pipeline at the moment for California, um, but our research partners at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution actually have eight more buoys, I believe, on the East Coast. Um, so our hope is over the long term, we can expand at least some of the whale safe pieces to include all of North America. So especially those, those vessel analytics pieces. Um, we're hoping to expand later this year, but I'll drop in the chat um, the website for our partners at Woods Hole, and you can see where some of their their buoys are at. And you can actually see if you click on individual buoys, um, you can see some of the recent detections if you scroll down. But um, and our buoys are included on there as well. So another way you could act access the acoustics. Data. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, I think. That might do it for all the questions. Thanks for addressing these, these questions. And um, if anyone else thinks of anything else that's that they'd like to ask of our guests, um, please put it in. I'm just hearing from everybody what how what awesome work you're doing. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's pretty phenomenal what you've done. And, and to just, yeah, I can't say enough. Um, good about what you, and whale safe that that it's getting out there. I mean, we're we're pretty close to the the Bay Area, the the Farallons folks, and the Marine Mammal Center, and all of that. And of course, we've had our our own stories of whales that have been entangled and ship struck up here. So it's definitely very meaningful, um, and we appreciate you so much for giving us your time this evening and for all that you've done on this project. And yeah, well, thank you guys so much. As you know, it's all so interconnected. So our whales down here come up to you guys. So we appreciate you tuning in and, and welcoming us to present to your group.